Luke chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading from verse 39. Today I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I believe it does a lot of the exegesis for us. Here's what it says. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to read verse 41 one more time. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and help me announce my sermon topic. Say, neighbor, I'm still asking for a friend. You may be seated in the presence of God. I'm still asking for a friend. One city somewhere around the 1940s or 1950s, housing trends in America began to radically shift. That, that people wanted to move out of the apartment communities in the city, and they wanted to move into homes in the suburbs. They wanted to escape the crowds in the city without losing the convenience and connection that those neighborhoods brought them. They didn't want the crowds, but they did want the connection. And so home builders developed something that we call subdivisions. Rather than people building homes acres or miles away from one another, they created lots so that homes could be built near one another. That way you could have privacy without isolation. You could have your own space without being completely removed from somebody else's. They called these new developments planned communities. The home builders realized that if you wanted to develop community, you would have to do it intentionally. And is it possible that we go through seasons of our lives where we feel, where we feel alone, not because people have abandoned us, but rather because we haven't prioritized remaining connected to them? Can I say that again? Is it possible that you go through seasons of your life where you feel alone, not because people have abandoned you, but because you have not prioritized remaining connected to them? This is not on the screens. This is Theo Muses on the spot revelation. I want you to put this in your notes. Friendship is a movement in two parts. Hmm. Friendship is a movement in two parts. You have the friend that you desire. Hmm. You have the friend that, you're desi- that you desire to have, but you also have the friend you are designed to be. Can I say that again? You have the friend that you desire to have, but you also have the friend that you were designed to be. And many of us are mad when we look around and we're disappointed at the friends we don't have, but we never take a second to examine the friend we're not being. Say amen or say ouch when I preach. It's the exact same thing. If you're not careful, you'll be quick to point the finger and say, I supported everybody. When's somebody going to support me? I look around and nobody's there for me the way I was for them. And I'm convinced that what God wants to tell many of us is that he who desires a friend must first show himself friendly. And maybe you don't have the friends you want because you have not been the friend that you want to reap from other people. What am I encouraging you to in this season is to seriously and radically invest in the friendships you have with other people because you reap what you sow. And see, you you think that when we say you reap what you sow, that means that if you put $10 in, in the offering, you'll get back $100. But but can I be honest with you? Many of us are frustrated with our friendships, and truth be told, we're just reaping what we sowed. (laughs) You're just reaping what you sowed. You didn't show up for them the way you should. Why every friendship in your life has to be about you? 
Say amen. amen. Or say ouch. I promise you, it's the exact same thing. No, many of us are frustrated about a friendship that we don't have yet, and maybe God is saying you'll have it when you learn to be it. Hmm, Jesus Christ. Can, can, can I go further this morning? All right, here, here it is. Here it is. Recent studies show that feelings of loneliness are at an all-time high. Hmm. 30% of people often or always feel lonely. Now, now, now I read this study, and I start tripping because how is it that, that 30% of people often or always feel lonely when we've got social media, we've got text, email, FaceTime, and whatever Android users use. <laughs> what y'all have, duh? And it's called duh, right? What it's called, duh, duh du, du, duo, duo, duh, don't. <laughs> we have all of these ways to get and remain connected, yet we live in the loneliest generation of all time. Is it possible that we become digitally more connected but socially and authentically less connected. Uh-oh, uh-oh, slide your feedback, because I chose violence today. <laughs> B- because, because these digital connections are great, but they put pressure on us to present our best selves at all times, even when that best self isn't accurate. Hmm. And see, what I've learned is, is that you can put a filter on your face for Instagram, but you can't put a filter on your faith when you're doubting whether or not God is going to show up in your life the way he said that he would. And you're so used to putting filters on what you post for the public that you haven't learned to take that face off to be real with the people that God called to walk in your life. It's going to be good today. All right. These digital connections are great, but they put pressure on us to present our best selves, even when that best self isn't accurate. All right. This results in us putting out a false identity. And why is that dangerous? Because a false identity will create false intimacy. Mm, That's on the screen. A false identity will create false intimacy. All right, let, let me help y'all understand what I mean. Uh, you ever been dating somebody? And when you met them, you were just like, oh, this is it. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, you were ready. I mean, y'all, y'all been dating 48 hours, and you already looking at wedding rings. <laughs> y'all met last night. I need him in love by tomorrow. <laughs> we together. It's me and you. Stop playing with me, boy. Stop playing with me. We go together real bad. <laughs> Brothers, you know how it is when you, when you meet her and, and she not fine, she's so fine. That's a whole nother level of fine. Right? It's like, oh man, bro. <laughs> I met this little whoop de whoop. <laughs> she was so fine. And everything seems to be going so well for that first season. And then out of nowhere, it's like things start to change. And you're like, who is this person? You mean to tell me that was a rental that wasn't your car? (laughs) That wasn't your real hair? I need to chill. I need to stop. All right, yeah. All right. I'll stop. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Listen, fellas, next time you meet somebody, just snatch their eyelash real quick. Just. (laughs) 
I need to quit while I'm ahead. All right, I'll stop. I'm sorry. It is Mother's Day. Let me chill. But, but, but you ever been dating somebody? It's like y'all texting all the time and, and y'all on the phone all night. Y'all not talking on the phone. Back in the day, we used to call it jonesing. You get on the phone and it's late at night and you like, you hang up. No, you hang up first. No, I just, I can't, I just can't stand saying bye to you. All right, well, how about this? On three, we both gonna hang up. One, two, Three, nobody hung up. <laughs> and then somehow, as time went on, that frequency of communication, those butterflies that you felt inside, it's like they went away, and you're wondering, who is this person that I'm dating? Because it's not like what it used to be when we first got together. But can I tell you the truth? You aren't dating them. You were dating their representative. They sent the best version of themselves for those first couple weeks to reel you in. And then once they got you, they got comfortable enough to drop the charade. And the problem is, is that you have now built a relationship with a person who actually doesn't exist. Hmm. Can I be honest with you? We do this in our friendships too. We put out a false identity, which then births false intimacy. Can I go further? We try to do this in our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Now, y'all know I'm going to do this. We've been together 16 weeks. At this point, we know each other. So you come to church and you, I got more than enough. I'm going to get my stuff. He won't fail. He won't leave you. No, he won't fail. You do all of that. You pray and you cry and you snot ball. And then, and then you don't talk to God till next Sunday. And God is in heaven on a Sunday. He like, oh, yes, she finally get it. Oh, yes, he finally get it. Oh, we locked in. We together now. We really about to walk with each other. And when you walk out the door, he doesn't hear from you until you walk back in Sunday. And God is in heaven like, I thought we had built some intimacy, but that intimacy was built on false identity. This is why I'm glad that in this season of your life, you are taking your relationship with God so seriously that Sunday is not the only time you're with him. Sunday is not the only time. Time you're in your word. No, like the deer pants after water, so does my soul long after you. No, we cannot keep creating false identity because if we do, then we'll build false intimacy around false identity. Like, like you ever been friends with somebody and then the real them showed up and you're like, who are you? I didn't know you were capable of that. I didn't know you could do that, right? And in our text today, I believe we meet two women who show us the power of planned community. In Luke chapter 1, we encounter Elizabeth, who's an older woman. And after many years of believing for a child, her and her husband, Zachariah, they, they, were, they were old, they had been faithful, they had been serving in, in God's house for a long time, and they have been believing God, that God would bless them with a child, and it just hadn't happened And in Luke chapter 1, Elizabeth finally finds out that God has answered her prayer. Jesus Christ. But we also meet a young woman by the name of Mary, who is not quite married, a virgin, and she's just found out she's pregnant too. They're both pregnant with something, but they got problems. Mm, And this is not in my message, but I do want to pause for a moment and help you to realize that, yes, you might be pregnant with something that God has put inside of you. But just because you're pregnant with something doesn't mean that it's not going to come without some problems. And many of us haven't given birth to what God has put inside of us because when we realize that there were problems attached to it, if you don't have real faith, you'll quit too soon. But all my real mamas in the house can tell you that when stuff starts getting difficult and when you start feeling pain, that's a sign that it's time for you to push so that what's inside of you can actually come out. Can I find somebody to preach to in the house who can say, Pastor Hollis, I'm so serious about getting what's inside of me out 
that when difficulty comes, that doesn't mean that I'm going to quit. No, that's a sign for me to go harder. That's a sign for me to keep pushing. That's a sign for me to keep going. And I'm not preaching to everybody, but I am preaching to somebody who's got a type of faith to say that what God has put inside of me is too important for me to quit just because it got hard. They're pregnant, but they got some problems. Here it is. What's the problem, Pastor Hollis? Well, nobody will believe that Elizabeth is pregnant. And then nobody will believe how Mary got pregnant. <laughs> Elizabeth walking around, I'm pregnant. they like, what, girl? <laughs> girl, stop playing with us. <laughs> Mary walking around telling people she's pregnant, and it's the talk of the town. It's a scandal waiting to break loose. Uh-oh, uh-oh, th- th- this is good. Because the relationship we see them building in Luke chapter 1 is an answer to a problem that they're experiencing. This is so good. Mm, this is so good. Because the right community should be an answer to a problem. That's good, Hollis, and it's right there on the screen, that the right community should be an answer to a problem. Here's what I'm done with in 2024. I'm done running to my, I'm I'm tired of running to people with my problems who make me feel worse when I'm done talking to them instead of better. I'm done running to people who when I'm done talking to them, I feel more fear than I do faith. Because the right community should be an answer to a problem. And I want to take a moment and I want to preach to the friends in the room who everybody knows they can trust you with their problems. You're not going to tell nobody. You're not going to run their business around Nashville. But what you are going to do is, is you're going to hold them down. You're going to pray for them. You're going to cover them. Can I find a prayer warrior who people don't even realize that when they got you as a friend, they got a friend, a homie, somebody to fight with when they need it, somebody who will pray for them and cover them? Because the right community should be an answer to a problem. I need everybody to repeat after me. I am an answer. No, say it like you mean it. I am am. an answer. I'm an answer to problems that are all around me. And when people get connected to me, they don't just get connected to a person. They get connected to a problem solver. Jesus Christ. Well, I just want to know what you bring to the table. Baby, I am the table because I'm a problem solver. And when you get next to me, you get next to a person who can help you figure out the fight that you're going through. Because the right community should be an answer to a problem. Hmm. All right. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? And I want you to, I want you to put this in your notes. It's not on the screen. But what problem or problems are your friendships solving? Can I go deeper? Can I go deeper, church? Or is the truth of the matter is that that relationship, that friendship, that community is creating more problems than it's solving? Mm. Is it possible that that relationship, that friendship that you're fighting to keep, could it be that it's actually creating more problems than it's solving? All right. No, 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 this is good because look at what the Bible says in verse 39. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. This is so good. The Bible says a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea. All right, put this in your notes. It's on the screen. Not only does the right community, should it be an answer to a problem, but the right community requires proximity. Hmm. All right. Elizabeth is pregnant. At this point, most scholars believe she's between six and seven months. All right. So it's getting real. You got me? She, it's almost about that time. It's almost about that time. It's about to go down. Right. You know what I'm talking about, Elise? It's about to go down. So she, she just, she angry at breakfast. All right. As she gets closer to her due date, Things that she used to could do with ease have now become more difficult. Mm, I'm preaching to some mamas in a row. Now, the things you used to could do on your own, now you got to ask somebody else to do it for you. 
And then people got the nerve to get an attitude for, you, for with you like you actually wanted to have to ask them. And so during this time, culturally, what would happen is, is, is that when a woman was pregnant, one of her relatives would come and live with her during the final months to assist her in that pregnancy. Somebody sounded like, that sounds good to me. <laughs> one of my moms like, I did this on my own. Right? In other words, when things got chaotic, they got closer. Mm. When things got chaotic, their friendship brought them closer. And here's a question that I want to ask you so you can ask yourself. When things get th thick and difficult in your life, do they get closer to you? Or do they get further away? Because real friendship, when chaos comes, it should bring us closer. The Bible says that, that, that a friend lives at all times and a brother was born for adversity. There are some friendships that you don't even know how strong they are until some mess jump off. Like, like, like I need the type of friends who, uh, one, one of my line brothers is here, uh, Tavares and his beautiful wife, they came in town to surprise us. Y'all make some noise for my line brother. And, and, and one of the things that, that I learned while we were pledging Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the greatest fraternity <laughs> on, on the face of the planet, what was I learned that, that you don't really know who's really your brother, you don't really know who's really your friend until certain things jump off in your life. And I don't know about you, but we should have matured to a point to where I'm tired of calling people friends who aren't really there when I truly need them to be there. No, in this season of my life, I need people who are so committed to our community that no matter if things are going well or things are going bad, I can count on them. Because when things get chaotic, that means we should get close. Yeah. Difficulty shouldn't always mean distance. And, and, oh, God, this is so good. And can I tell you what? This proximity isn't always physical. Because sometimes your, best, your closest friends are the furthest away from you. But when was the last time you called me just to check to see how I was doing? Can I be real for just a moment and minister to, to some different dynamics that are in the room? Because for, for some of us, Mother's Day isn't a happy day. Can I be honest with you? For some people, we have mixed emotions on Mother's Day. Maybe because th there's a mother who, who is no longer here. Or maybe it's because there's a mother who was never there. And so you'll be surprised in this very room how many dynamics are actually there. Some people couldn't wait for Mother's Day. And other people can't wait for it to be over. You mean to tell me that's your friend and you know what a day like this could mean to them? How difficult it might be and you didn't even shoot them a text message? See, see, it's one thing to shout. It's another thing for us to get the substance that we need to actually become who God is calling us to be. Maybe God has you sitting in this room so that you can send a text message from this room to a room across the country that helps them to be able to realize that they're not by themselves. Because when life gets chaotic, real community gets closer. I got to hurry. I got to get you out on time. You got to take your mom to lunch. All right. But I also see here, the Bible says that a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. This is so good. This is so good. She hurried to the hill country. All right? Now, now I'm not the smartest man in the world, but a hill does mean that there's a change in elevation. In fact, when I did the research of this journey, I found out that it was a 90-mile journey that Mary had to take by foot. Somebody like, you know what? <laughs> Babe, we just wouldn't be friends. <laughs> 90 mile journey by foot. Can I help y'all? And she pregnant. Mmm. You, you see how alive the Bible is when you really dig into it? 90, day, 90 mile journey for Mary on foot. But can I help you with something? 
community isn't always convenient. That's so good. Community isn't always convenient. And some of us don't have the community that we should have because we don't know how to be inconvenienced. You won't go out of your way for nobody. Jesus Christ. And I can't understand how, as a believer or somebody who's even leaning into your faith, because I have to recognize everybody in this room may not be a believer. Some of you are here, and I'm so glad that you are, because you're curious about your faith. You're trying to figure out your faith. Can I tell you, as those of us who are believers or who are trying to figure out whether or not we are believers, one of the things that we should be moving towards is this idea that when we serve other people, that might mean inconveniencing ourselves. This is so good. Never forget that I told you this. If you don't hear another word that I said, I want you to hear this next sentence that I'm about to say. God will not call you to a season of self-sabotage, but he will call you to a season of self-sacrifice. Did you hear what I just said? God will never call you to a season of self-sabotage, but he will call you to a season of self-sacrifice. And some of us are too selfish to have real friendships. Say man or say ouch. No. She takes this 90-mile journey uphill. And the girl pregnant. She, she couldn't call an Uber. <laughs> no. She had to walk. Why? Because community is sometimes inconvenient. Wow. This is so good. Here's a question I want to ask you, all right? Are you committed enough to community that you'll build it even when it's inconvenient? That's real. Like, like some people, are, I'm convinced, we need to release them from friendships. And I, look, I love you enough to just like release you from this. Like, I, I'm not committed enough. Because you've got to learn to communicate around your commitments. I'm done, all right? Here, here it is, here it is. I'm gonna give you one more thing and then we're done. When we look at, when we look at verse 39, this hill country, she's gotta travel up to the hills, all right? I want, you, I want you to get this word, this picture in your mind. She's traveling up to the hills in order to spend time with someone who she's building a friendship and community with. You know why? Because community should always pull you higher. Mm, this is so good. Community should always pull you higher. And one of the questions you've got to ask yourselves about the people that you're in community with is, are they pulling me higher? Or are they dragging me lower? Because there are some people who aren't friends, they're weight. De dead weight. And so in order for you to keep moving, guess what you got to do? You got to drag them with you everywhere you go. Do you know how crazy I would look if every time I decided to move on this stage, I had to try and grab this whole podium and take it with me? Do you know how that would, how that would slow me down, how that would keep me from doing what I'm called to do? Look at me how crazy I look trying to operate in my purpose and my calling that I shouldn't actually be dragging. And y'all looking at me crazy, but this is how you look moving forward in your career, dragging those people who won't even work hard to do the same thing that you're doing in yours. This is how you look trying to build a good marriage, but you keep getting on the phone with Keisha, and she, all she do is complain about her marriage, and here you are trying to build up yours, and then you wonder why you get off the phone with her, and then some kind of way now you mad at your husband about a problem y'all didn't even have before you talk to her because you dragging weight. And look at how crazy I look, dragging something that's slowing me down, trying to make sure that it makes it where it should be. And I'm sacrificing who and what God has called me to be. And now I can't even keep my eyes on where I'm going because I'm spending too much time reaching back to drag something else. And you got to ask yourself, what is the community that you're in doing? Is it pulling you higher or is it dragging you lower? I, I'm, I'm done, but, but, but my favorite part is in verse 41, and it's on the screen. It says, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. I like that part. 
Because what's the sign of a real friendship? Is when I get around you, something inside me starts. It starts leaping. I, I get excited about stuff. I get motivated about some things. I'm, I'm ready to pursue some things that maybe I didn't want to pursue before I got around you. You know what type of pastor and what type of leader I want to be? I want to be the type of pastor and I want to be the type of leader that when you get around me, something in you starts. It starts leaping that you're not comfortable in old seasons anymore because you got around somebody that made you start leaping. I want the business owner in you to start leaping. I want the father in you to start leaping. I want that kingdom entrepreneur in you to start leaping. I want that man or woman that's supposed to have a master's or a doctorate degree. I want it to start leaping to the point that you stop settling and you stop playing it safe and instead you start running after everything that God has called you to be. You got to ask yourself, when you get around them, does something in you start leaping? Do you get motivated when you're around them? She walks in the room, and the Bible says, hmm, this is so good, that at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the right community should help you with your purpose. Mm, The right community should help you with your purpose. I love the fact that the Bible says she was filled with the Holy Spirit when she got around the right people. And can I tell you something? It's great to tell you how a friendship should help you pursue a degree. And it's great to tell you that a friendship should help you pursue home ownership and that a friendship should help you pursue more money and more peace and more joy. But can I tell you what friendships in your life should help you pursue? More than anything else, when you get around the right people in the right community, it should make you pursue Jesus in a way that you've never pursued him before. Can I tell you something? I'm done running with people who drag me away from my faith. I need people who will push me closer to becoming who God wants me to be. Even if it's not more money, with God I can have more peace. Even if it's not more house, with God I can have more joy. I need people in my life who are pushing me closer to Jesus. No, I need a friend with the Holy Spirit inside of them. I need a friend who will call me in the, in, in the, right when I'm getting ready to do something stupid and say, Hollis, what you doing? <laughs> Hollis, where you at? Oh, uh, oh. Uh. No, I need some friends who got the Holy Spirit inside of them because the Holy Spirit, I had you calling me at the exact moment that I needed somebody to pray for me. And even though you don't know what's going on, the Holy Spirit will help you make intercession even without information and without an invitation. You don't have to know what's going on for you to start praying and speaking some things over my life. Can I tell you something? And, and this doesn't mean that everybody in your circle is, is just a holy roller. That's not what I'm saying. No. What I am saying is, is that I need people around me who will not make me compromise my relationship with Christ just so I can have a relationship with them. You know, you know what I need? I want a friend who will look me in my face and say, Hollis, you're wrong. Hollis, you're wrong. Hey, Hollis, you need to stop that. Chill, bro. Like, like what's wrong with holding our friends accountable? Because if you won't hold them accountable, that's why they get out in the world and act crazy. Because you didn't say something to them first. Stand to your feet, we're going home. But when you're around somebody, y'all, y'all relationship got to be about more than just a good time. It's got to be about more. Got to be about more than just becoming a good person. Because Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. Can you receive that? 
And what do I want out of my friendships? I want a friendship that makes me feel alive. 